Heavenly Father, today we put on the full armor to protect us against attack. We put on the belt of truth to protect against lies and deception. We put on the breastplate of righteousness to protect our hearts from the temptations. We put the gospel of peace on our feet to walk in your light, peace, and freedom with the Holy Spirit. We rebuke anxious thoughts. We take up your shield of faith for protection to block and destroy all the darts and threats thrown at us by the enemy. We put on the helmet of salvation to cover our minds and thoughts, reminding us that we are children of a mighty king. We are forgiven, set free, saved by the blood of Jesus. We take up the sword of the spirit, your living word, that has the power to demolish strongholds and is sharper than any double-edged sword. We come to you, Lord, in prayer daily. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. What's up, you guys? Welcome to The Imagination. I'm your host, Emma, and today we have back on the show for the second time to share her testimony in full, human trafficking, SRA, torture and mind control survivor, anti-child abuse advocate, podcast host of Unbroken, speaker, author, writer, and walking miracle, Max Lowen. Max was born into a multi-generational trauma-based mind control family and was the daughter of diplomatic parents. Her abuse began at birth with the Italian side of her family, where her uncle ran a secret underground facility in Rome with underground tunnels that connected to the Vatican. It was through these tunnels that she would be taken to the Vatican, where she would bear witness to and experience horrific and heinous abuse and crimes as a child. And through the diplomatic connections of her parents, she would be subjected to child trafficking, satanic ritual abuse, torture, and mind control at the hands of Italian and European elite. Max's testimony shines a bright light on the global deep state political machine and is an important puzzle piece to the bigger picture. Max's abusers did everything they could to break her and little did they know the only thing breaking would be the cycle of generational trauma. For it was Max who had the courage to say no more and who stands here today unbroken and whole. She now has a podcast that is ironically and fittingly called Unbroken, where she interviews survivors and truth warriors who dare to break the curses placed upon them by their captors by speaking their truths for people who have eyes to see and ears to hear. It is through Max's work that we can all learn how survivors are the antithesis of broken. They are anti-fragile, they are unbroken, and they are unbreakable. Max stands here before us as a living testament to her podcast name, and I would highly recommend all of you go and follow and support her amazing work at her website, www.unbroken.global, as well as finding her podcast on platforms like BitChute, Rumble, and Brighteon. I will have all these listed in the show notes for all of you to go click on super easily. The thing I love most about Max is how unbreakable she is. She not only carries her own story and testimony on her shoulders, but she so selflessly carries the weight of a million other survivor stories and testimonies on her shoulders through her work as a podcast host and podcast guest. Her voice shaking the Luciferian kingdom like lightning bolts that continue to strike and burn it down story by story, testimony by testimony, word by word. Survivors like Max are the heroes we need in the world, and I can't wait to share her amazing testimony with all of you today. Before I finish introducing today's guest, I just wanted to give a quick reminder that if you are a survivor or whistleblower who wants to share your story on the podcast or who wants to share any information privately with me, you can now email me at imaginabetterworld2020 at gmail.com. You can also support me on Substack at www.emmacatherine at substack.com, where I'll be taking up journaling as an outlet for me to personally reflect on the podcast guests and my advocacy work. All of my social media links are also in the show notes, and I can't thank all of you for your endless love and support of this show and each amazing guest who has the courage to come on and share. So you guys, without further ado, please help me in welcoming Voice for the Voiceless content creator, advocate for the children, and the child they tried to break who grew into the woman who could not be broken, the one, the only, Max Lowen. Max, thank you so much for being here with me today. Well, thank you for having me and for that really beautiful introduction. I'm a little overwhelmed by everything you said, so thank you. (laughs) You're Um, welcome. I love doing the intros. It's like a little gift I can give you. Like, People don't understand all the time that survivors don't get to hear those things growing up. You know, it's like all the most beautiful things about you are used against you. And so it's like such a beautiful thing for me to be able to 
reinvert that and give it to you in the way that it was meant to be. So thank you for being here, Max. I'm really honored to have you back on. We got so much good feedback last time you were on. And I mean, even just from the little bit that you shared, people, you know, reached out and were like, oh my gosh, get her on. She was, you know, I really want to know about the Vatican or she mentioned this. So, you know, I think your testimony and your healing journey and, and all the ways that you've taken what happened to you and you've turned it into all these beautiful projects that you're working on now. I'm really excited for people to just to learn more about you and, and, and the gift that you are. So why don't we go back to the beginning? I'll sort of hand it off to you. And why don't we talk a little bit about your family, your upbringing, and, and we can just have a good conversation around that and sort of lead it up to where you are today. Sure. Um, so, you know, I think I'll start before the beginning um, in the sense that um, when I recovered the memories of trauma, I also recovered other kinds of memories because they're all sort of tied together. And one thing that I remembered is being at this meeting. It was not here on Earth. It was. It seemed like it was some kind of a galactic meeting. So there were humans, but other beings too. And they were talking about Earth and the issues here. And I, I remember I scouted, like I came in a timeline and kind of took a peek and it looked really like basically Armageddon. It looked, you know, horrible here. And so I, then I was suddenly back at the meeting and I, I said, I'll, I'll go, I volunteer. And so did a bunch of others there. So, you know, that is a memory that had come to me. And when I was a little girl, for I, I remembered not exactly that, but I remembered that I came here by choice, right? And at first, when I was really little, I thought maybe it because I remember being about two or three and thinking, my God, what is this place? You know, it's so dark and it's so dense. And you know, I was living in a very dark reality too. So, um, and so I always had this feeling like it was a little, this place was a little different or a little odd. So I knew, I couldn't put it in words at that age, but I knew I, I sort of come here with a, with a mission for lack of a better word. And in retrospect, I, um, I knew when I was little also this kind of odd detail, which is that the balance of light and dark on the planet was really skewed towards dark. And, you know, there's a lot of information out there and I don't claim to know the exact truth, but I do think that was the case that this was an experiment in balance between light and dark. And then, you know, it really tipped in on the wrong end towards dark. So I feel like I kind of like absorbed a lot of that dark in the situations I was in and sort of kept it in my body until I was old enough to process that and let it out. And it's like a transmutation of light into dark. So I feel like that was one of the things that um, that I did that was important. And then the other thing is, you know, and you alluded to that in your introduction, after all that I went through, which I'll talk about, um, it only makes sense to me to, a few years ago, I, I was motivated to just tell, by God, to tell my story. Um, why? Because children today, all over the world, are still being abused in the ways that I'm going to describe. It's, it's really, that's the one thing that still hurts me. I have a really good life now, but I think about that. And so I think there's two really important things that all of us need to do. We need to do our inner work, the shadow work, you know, the healing work, because we're all traumatized to some degree. It's a continuum, right? And when we do that, when we heal, we we kind of recover ourselves and we're full of potential. We have much more potential than we're told by the outside authorities. And so that's step one. And then the other half is to really understand the truth because we live in a world of mind control and manipulation and lies. So almost everything that we're told is a distortion of the truth in some way. So to really understand what is, is important. And if you take that inner and then that outer, I think at that point, we, we rise in consciousness, we rise in frequency and we're kind of 
in our highest potential. And then we can we can remember, why did I come here? I do believe myself, we all came here to do a little piece of whatever it takes to transition this place from the hell on earth that it's been made into, into more of a heaven on earth, which I think it originally was intended to be, right? So just wanted to start with that. I love that. I want to make one comment too about point one that you had. They were both beautiful. When we do that inner healing too, then we ensure that we're not passing on trauma, you know, because that's yes. really, even if you've only had a little bit, you know, if you're just continually in a bad mood or maybe have, you know, a temper once in a while, like that still affects children, you know, or bad eating habits, whatever it is, however, we're mistreating ourselves because of not healing. You know, if we have a kid, we're, we're still passing some of that on. So doing that inner healing too ensures that, hey, the next generation is going to have it better than me. And then hopefully the generation after that, you know, and slowly but surely we end up healing all that trauma, just like what you're going to, like how you said that you're going to explain that you had the courage to walk away from. Yeah, no, that's actually a really good point, Emma. You know, it, it's like a very simple example would be, it is a psychological phenomenon that sometimes people will repeat the trauma if you're unconscious about it. So the classic example would be like a, a, a woman who's in a domestic violence relationship who's being battered. And it's it's likely that she would unconsciously gravitate towards someone who would do that because she grew up in an abusive home. And if you don't deal with it, then you attract subconsciously the familiar, not necessarily the healthy, right? I do think there's a there's a good impulse behind that, drawing the familiar, because you, you give yourself another opportunity to fix it, to address it, right? Um, or the mother who was sexually abused as a child and doesn't didn't heal from it might will not see if her child is being sexually abused because she can't see her own, so she can't afford to see it out there. So that's a really good point you make. We can, in whatever way, sort of pass that on if we don't deal with it. And the other piece to that is if we if we're full of trauma, we have the the loop negative thinking the the you know hopelessness and despair thinking and we might be drawn to uh, addictions of some kind to numb that pain that wants to kind of come out and then all of those i mean even emma every thought we have this is like this is something i think about every day every thought we have goes out into the world we're all interconnected it has a frequency and it so it adds to the outer collective consciousness. So we really want to be careful to be as you know positive. And it doesn't mean to ignore what's negative. So we can look at something and go, oh God, you know, this is happening. But then the attitude should be first, like, is it triggering me? Let me clean out what's in me that's related to this. And then secondly, you know, what can I do? And have a and then have like so being angry at someone or saying negative things or judging or gossiping that creates worse trauma in the field. And then it affects us anyway. Right. So I just wanted to validate what you said. I think that is, thank you. That is really important. And I love that those are your inspirations, you know, and hopefully people on the other side too. I know not everybody's in a place where maybe they can come out and talk or maybe they're not even out, you know, but just hearing seeing somebody like you who is on the other side saying, Hey, my life is pretty good now. You know, it's not perfect, but it's good, you know, and, and I'm able to live this way because of all the work that I did, you know, and seeing that from you, I know gives so many people hope who are feeling that, that, that that's impossible, you know? So I appreciate you sharing that because hopefully it gives somebody on the other side courage to maybe talk about it or to, to, you know, take steps towards the same healing that you did. Yeah, I think we all have healing to do and it, and it really makes our lives better. I mean, I'm so glad that I did the work I did and it's still ongoing. You know, I don't think we're ever like done. I, I my therapist, I remember a long time ago, I, I may have asked a question like, you know, will I, when will I be cured? And she said, only hands are cured. <laughs> so I think that's a good one. Like we're always working on ourselves because we can always go to a higher and higher level, right? So yeah, definitely. And if I can come back from what I'm going to describe, then any of us can, you know, it's, it's, it's hard, but it's so worth it rather than carrying all that 
it, it's kind of like walking through life with these heavy, heavy suitcases full of your issues. Well, if you unpack that stuff and take it, then you're then you're lighter, you're freer, you know, and you can actually make choices based on what's in front of you rather than what's in your past. Absolutely. Yeah. And it gave chills down my spine whenever you said that you had that vision that you chose this life, you know, and it almost chokes me up, honestly, because people are going to hear like what type of a life that you chose to step into, you know, for the better of humanity and like how important the work is now that you're doing to bring awareness to this. Cause you're right. It is still happening, you know? So why don't we start talking about, about your life? I'll let you start wherever you want, but I want people to understand the life that you chose to be here for and your amazing purpose that you have now as a healed woman. Yeah. And so I'll just preface that with, um, cause somebody once said to me something weird, like, oh, you chose to come and be abused. And so I just want to clarify, I chose to come, as many of us did, to be God's warrior. It's like if you enlist in it, it you want to serve. That's why you come. So then these things happened. But my intent was to come and serve. So I just want to clarify that. I didn't, I didn't want to be <laughs> brutalized. Um, yeah. So yeah, so I was born in uh, in 1964, and um, at the time, uh, my dad was a Marine, so I was born in a in a base in Southern California, and my mom is Italian, um, and he got sent to Vietnam when I was uh, a baby, and so my mother has clearly been abused herself. She's a very fragile person. So even not having my dad there threw her into a depression. So she wouldn't get up and come feed me or, or change me. Um, and so in the very, very beginning, I remember both crying and needing someone to come. But then when she would come, she would be very angry and violent. So I, right from the beginning, this kind of thing of like, well, either either someone comes or either you're abandoned and no one comes or somebody shows up, but then it's violent, right? So that kind of, you know, that was a, not, not a great beginning. And so my uncle, her much older brother, who runs a, a, who ran a secret facility in Rome under the ground, you know, these exist all over the world. They they do experiments, they do torture, you know, they do that kind of stuff. Um, he actually came to visit when I was a few months old. So it began before I was one. And I remember a ritual that he did to break attachment, where he had the room darkened and he had like a, a light and he had my mom tied to a chair in front of me. And I remember, you know, holding the crib bars and, and barely, you know, not being able to look over the top, looking through the little bars. And he used really loud noises, like a gong sound and strobe the lights up on and off. And then he picked me up by my ankle and spun me around. So I since much later learned that that spinning technique is something that they do, that they use in MK Ultra. So it, it helps shatter the baby right away into fragments. And, you know, it puts in this, and, you know, even today, as you know, because we've talked about it, sometimes I get vertigo. And I, I think it's related to that, that thing um, that happened to me. In any case, so right from the beginning, he wanted to break the attachment bond, which was already fragile between me and my mom. And um, so sometimes in the countries I lived in, he would show up and do things. And then every Christmas break and every summer, my mom would take us to Rome, um, where he was and where the facility was. And then when I was 14, and my parents divorced, we moved there with my mom full time, just just setting up like the kind of access that my uncle had to me. Um, when my dad came back from the war, uh, he joined the, the foreign service, you know, became a diplomat. Um, and we were living in Chile at the time. And this was right before my dad um, returned. My uncle then did another ritual that that I that a memory that came back for me in a church. Um, the church was empty. It was just 
my mom and her, at the time her parents and siblings were living there because her father was also a diplomat. Um, and so they were in the pews of the church and I was about two and I was taken and put on the altar and um, they had a, a metal cross that they heated up and they laid it right here on my chest. So it I can remember the smell of burning flesh and just the, the pain of the heat. And there was a priest there and my uncle, and they were kind of doing some kind of ritual. I, you know, I'm not clear if it was like pledging me to Satan or what it was, but they mix the, you know, supposedly Christian thing with the satanic. So they do these twisted things um, with that. And then I was put in a uh, very small coffin and they put the lid on and they left me there overnight. And part of the ritual again was to show me that they owned me, not my mom, because they couldn't, they were there. I'm sure it was traumatic for them to have to be there and witness this, but of course they didn't do anything. They didn't say anything. So. You know, it, it was just these layering in that I'm different, um, no one's going to help me, um, you know, they have all the power and control. Um, after that, uh, we moved to Lesotho, which is a little tiny country inside, it's landlocked around uh, the country of South Africa, but it's its own little country. And um, that period of two years was the one time in my life when my uncle didn't visit or we didn't go to Italy, um, probably because it was just too far and, and you know, rural there. Um, and I had a, a nanny, a basuto nanny, who was really, really good to me. So I had these two years from like three to five where it was okay besides my mom. So then my mom, I think, was I don't know, program to do this or if she was acting out her own trauma, but she would do things like burn me with cigarettes or, you know, try and like smother me with a pillow or just generally beat me or just tell me that, you know, that I was that, that I was bad, you know, that kind of psychological stuff. But I had this counterbalance in uh, my nanny. Her name was Loretta. And I still remember her vividly because it was it was the one time that I experienced this safe love, you know, from somebody. And um, I remember the when my mom and, and dad said, well, we're going to move. We're going to go to the next country. And um, I was devastated at the idea of losing her. And she took me outside uh, one evening, it was dark, and we could see the stars in the sky. And she had me lay on the ground and look up with her. She held my hand and she said um, that I had to hang in there. And she said, she said, look at the stars and tell me what you see. And I said, well, I, I said, oh, I see like a whole bunch of them shooting down to the planet. And she said, yes, she said, those are all the people like you who came here. And she said, if you stay alive, because later you're going to find all those people. Yeah. Oh my God. And if so, I never forgot that. And it was one of the things that kept me going. And Emma, I have found those people. I have, there's you, there's all the people that helped me with Unbroken. There's all the incredible people I've interviewed I, I feel like, wow, that actually did come true, you know, so, and the day that uh, we left, um, it was this rinky dink airport with a, you know, one of those little tiny planes. And uh, I remember clinging to her and I told my mom, <laughs> leave me here, you know, you guys go, I want to, I want to stay with her. Um, but, you know, that wasn't possible. So they ripped me out of her arms. And I just remember my last memory is looking out the little airplane window and seeing her getting smaller and smaller and smaller. It just, you know, it broke my heart, but I'm grateful that I had that experience. And um, so I'll just pause here in case you wanted to make any comments or ask questions and I'll go on. I think that's amazing. The story about the nanny, you know, I hear periodically about just seems like, you know, God inserts an angel somewhere in, in a child's life just to let them experience love. 
So they keep that with them as they're going through everything. And that's such a blessing that you did have that. Have you, have you tried getting in contact with her or did you? You know, I have an idea that I want to um, go. I have no idea what her last name is. My parents claim they don't remember. Um, so, but I have an idea that I'm going to go there and I'm going to find her somehow. So she was maybe 19 or 20. So she would be, you know, maybe in her late 70s, early 80s. She's probably, she could still be alive. So I do have a goal to find her. <laughs> yes really magical it's how sweet I appreciate you sharing that story too because that is I mean we should all look at life that way and try to find the stars you know and, and that even in the dark there's still those little glimpses that we can hang on to even it's if, even if it's through a cloudy day that we have to find them you know just to know that they're there I think that's beautiful now you had mentioned your mom you think was also under trauma-based mind control so do you have um any ideas of maybe that running on her side of the family generationally or how or how that sort of infiltrated her family and then was it on your dad's side at all you know I don't know uh I do believe it was at least two generations on my mom's side for sure um they were um in they were in world war ii they were uh in a concentration camp for a while. Um, so there were some, there's these stories, but the, that family won't, they won't really talk about it. Um, so it's full of holes. I don't, I could never get the right story. Um, my dad's dad was also, was an American uh, foreign service officer. And my two grandfathers, the Italian and the American, were at the same time, uh, my American grandfather was amb US ambassador to Libya and the Italian one was the general consul. So that's where my parents met. Um, now, the family is political going on both sides generationally. So that is a factor. I believe I was programmed uh, for politics. Um, I have a photographic, audiographic memory. I speak uh, three languages completely fluently and a few others kind of fluently. Um, and I have like, I grew up with these cocktail parties and these events where I would meet presidents or dignitaries or things like that. So I was also trained in like impeccable social skills and how to talk with adults and relate. And so that's one of the facets of my training. So I believe that's probably what I was being groomed for considering the generational, you know, I've like three-star generals in my family and like people at all these kinds of levels. So um, I'm still unpacking that, but that's my, th that's what I have so far. Yeah. And then what did your uncle do? And what was this, how did he end up having this facility? Was it something that he built or was it already there? And he sort of, whether through the military or somewhere else ended up heading that. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I doubt he built it. I'm sure he was selected to run it. So these kinds of facilities, I mean, the whole world has underground tunnels, underground facilities. There have been underground cities down there. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but this is the reality. And so this one was in Rome. Um, it was, you know, you had to go down, down, down. And then it was huge. It was like a, a, a city block or two. It had everything in there. It had uh amazingly advanced technology that some of which I haven't even seen today. So, you know, they have technology that they don't share with us. You know, for example, people have, have discovered this, there's free energy technology that's been ex in existence for 70 years and, you know, but they're not going to give that to us because they can profit off, you know, the things that we use now. So he was the head of it. Um, and he was connected with people from the Italian mafia, from the Italian government and from the Vatican. And like you said, um, the facility in the Vatican had an underground train that connected them. So he would do experiments and torture on behalf of the Vatican. So yes, they were all, you know, th there's many different factions, but they're all run by the same people at the very tippy top of the pyramid, right? So they all work together in the background. Um, even governments of countries, and this is something that I was privy to because of my background, 
the presidents of countries are really low on the totem pole. They have layers of masters above them that tell them what to do. So somebody's running countries and the global, uh, the globe as a as a stage, like as a chessboard. So they plan wars, they fund both sides, they have agenda. Okay, we're gonna do a war here, so, so this and so that. And additionally with war, it it's a sacrifice to Lucifer because the hell and the carnage and the dead bodies. Um, so they love to do this kind of stuff. And my uncle was no exception. The man was so cruel and brutal and everyone was scared of him. So I remember he would take me into the facility and if somebody displeased him yet, he wore a gun, he would take the gun out, and just shoot them in the head. And then he'd snap his fingers and ask somebody to come clean it up. So he was ruthless. I believe Emma that he was inhabited by um, a demonic entity. I believe that they do this, these elites do this. They do these rituals and they invite demonic entities to inhabit them, um, to give them power and then wealth and fame. And so that's why I think it's so hard for people to accept that these kinds of people will rape babies, they will cook and eat babies, they will do horrific tortures to children because see, they're, we can't imagine that but that's because we're human and we have a connection through our heart to God. But these people, many of them have willingly chosen to sever that connection and instead to give themselves over to Lucifer to the dark. I know this sounds like some kind of movie or novel, but I swear to God that this is real because I saw it with my own eyes. I would be taken. And so the Vatican has like, sub levels and not even the levels where they have like the tombs but even under that they have this room with a huge marble altar and i witnessed this myself they took me there and they would have people standing around the altar and it would be the popes because there's more than one pope there's the one that shows his face to the world and then there's others and then there's um there were like vips or whatever you know ilk and they will bring in a baby or a small child and brutalize the child so that the the terror and the adrenaline is, is going in the body. And then they had a special knife and they would cut the child while alive from here like down and the blood would start to flow. And they had these chalices at the four corners of the altar where the, the blood would co collect. And if the child, often if the child was small, they would literally pluck out the heart and eat it. So, and then they would drink the blood. Now, people, if they've done their research, will have heard of adrenochrome. Um, this is done in almost like a factory manner with children and the blood is labeled by quality and age of the child and it's sold. So this is actually an industry, a hidden industry, but I witnessed it being drank just live in this ceremony. And what they were doing was making this offering to Lucifer. And I could feel these entities coming into the room and inhabiting the people. It, they weren't corporeal, but you could sort of see a dark smokiness and then mainly for me, it was this feeling of cold. It was like a cold that's undescribable in the room all of a sudden. And so I wanted to illustrate that example because they do these rituals still today. They do them, they're, they, they use astrology. So they use the full moon. Um, Halloween is a big sacrifice time, um, et cetera, like the major holidays. And they will do these kinds of rituals to bring more dark energy into themselves and into the planet. Um, I'll describe the facility a little bit too. So I was taken there a lot and I was put through torture. And when I say torture, it was a lot of electric shocks, you know, electrodes in different places um uh things like being locked in he had this 
like walk-in giant freezer where they would hang dead bodies and dead animal bodies. And I would be put in there for long periods of time. Um, I, would, I was buried alive uh, once that I can remember um, with dead bodies. So, you know, like, and left there to freak out for a period of time. Um, obviously, you know, rape, rape and beatings and things like that. Um, the worst for me was uh, he had a whole section where he had animals in cages and I was made to walk through this section. It's like a, a U, like an L and, or a U shape. And um, I'm going to say something kind of horrific. So just brace yourself. But I saw a calf, a baby cow that they had um, taken its skin off and they were dripping acid on it and it was screaming. Um, there were all these animals in various stages of torture. And the other one that really left an impression on me was a cat and they had like a, a metal spine and, and the cat was like um, held on this thing. And it was like a see-through tank and the bottom half had water in it. And there was, he pressed a button and lowered the cat into the water and put piranhas inside the tank so that the cat would basically be eaten alive. And there's more, but I'll just leave it at those two. And so I would be made to watch these horrific things. Um, he once brought a pregnant dog in and sliced her belly open right in front of me. Um, torturing animals, torturing people, um, murdering people. And, um, and then I'll, I'll pause, but then I, I would like to talk about the, uh, the experiments that were done on me. Um, but I'll, I'll kind of take a pause here. Thank you for sharing that. That is how you said, you know, people have a hard time believing this because it does sound it's beyond what anybody can comprehend. It's beyond what we see in horror movies. It's beyond where our imaginations can even, can even fathom to go, you know, but this is real. And like you said, there are, this is still going on, you know, whether it's the same person doing it or if it's passed on to the next person in line, you know, this has been set up that way for so long. And it's so disgusting and horrifying to think that just I mean, someplace like the Vatican too, you know, and, and around it, surrounding areas. Like this is an area that, that gets prestige in society. These are people that get held on pedestals. You know, the facade is is for people to marvel at it. People travel there just to go drive by and see it, you know, and people stand in line for miles just to see the Pope go by, you know, and it's so inverted how these things are presented to us. And so obviously when presented with conflicting information than what the public narrative is, it's really easy for society to just, not want to consider that because it shatters their reality. It shatters everything that they learned since they've, you know, been alive essentially, but this is the hard truth. This is the reality. You know, this is going on underneath the feet of, of tourists walking and taking pictures underneath there's, there's children, you know, and, and more there's people that are, you know, being forced to abuse children. Like, you know, it doesn't excuse what they're doing, but you know, this is a cycle and so you're doing an amazing thing by speaking out on this so we can break it, you know, and break that narrative and, and really show the people that are ready for it what is lurking under our feet and in the darkness. Yeah. And, you know, that's it, it's complicated because and, and the Vatican is a beautiful work of art. I mean, I've seen it all. Of course, I lived in Rome for many years and it's it's definitely something to be a, a, appreciated for what it is. It's not, and, and, and see, people think that they're worshiping God. And, but the, the, it's that twist, you know? So they, they trick people into feeling like this church is good and it's of God. But really underneath, the Jesuits are one of the most brutal group on the planet, you know? And you can add the Freemasons and the Illuminati. And, you know, these, they're all part of one, you know, order. But, that's the fact, you know, they, so they, that's what they do. They, they put this veneer of God and Jesus and whatnot, but then really underneath it is satanic. They are Satanists. And I, I think, you know, I don't want to say people, religion is comforting for people, you know, 
And 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 if you're if you're getting together with your community and you're uh, praying or worshiping God and you're good, you know that's great. I'm just saying that there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes and manipulations. And so one thing that I've thought of is, okay, so why is Jesus Christ, who I believe is absolutely real, why was he portrayed as a dead, tortured corpse on a cross? Why not portray him smiling and like alive, right? So right there, you've got a I won't, I won't give my opinion. I'll let people ponder that. Okay, what is that? And then there's communion. And again, the idea of communing with God is a good thing. But you're eating the flesh and drinking the blood. That's what the Satanists do. Okay, they're cannibals and they're vampires. They drink blood all the time. They eat babies and flesh all the time. So there's an interesting twist there. And when people go through that right, they're doing it for the right reasons, okay? But energy, they harvest our energy. And I believe that's one way that they do that because we unwittingly think we're doing this positive thing, but they're then taking that energy, positive energy of ours and using it and harvesting it, right? And Along those lines, that's also why they target very young children and babies, because those are the closest to God. If you've ever had a child or known a child, they're pure, they're angels, they're vulnerable, they're full of love and trust. They're actually how human beings are made to be before this world, you know, twists and distort us with all the stuff that goes on. And so they want to take that pure life force energy and steal it from children and then secondly, they hate God. So it's basically an F you to God, right? Um, so yeah, so I'll, I'll pause here, but yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's an inversion and it's so easy to fall for because it could be 99% truth, but it's that 1% lie, you know, that, that twists it and gets people sucked into the wrong thing. And then eventually 1% turns into two, you know, and it just it leads down this really dark path. So you're absolutely right with that. And I'll let you continue. I didn't, uh, I know that, that we got a little bit off track of what I wanted to comment on what you had said, but I think you were saying you wanted to talk about the experiments. Was that it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and this kind of goes into later, I understood, oh, this is MK Ultra. Of course, when I was going through it, I didn't know the names for any of these things. It was just what was happening to me. Um, but there were many kinds of experiments where like I would have this metal helmet placed on my head and it had wires coming out and attached to some machinery. Um, there, there was an instance actually when they were doing that and I concentrated really hard and I fritzed some of the connections. They sparked and they had to sort of stop it at that particular moment. Um, but a lot of things where I would have to, they had these like, they had virtual reality and this was in the seventies, right? So these things that you wear like a big mask and, and, and things that they play and audio stuff, um, I would be uh, made to say really, I would be told I had to say these really horrible things about myself into a, you know, a cassette tape recorder, what they used back then. And then they would play that and make me listen to it with headphones. So it would be like my own voice programming me to tell me how, how awful I was and this and that. Um, some of the experiments were, uh, I guess, psychological, but horrific. Um, there, I was always wanting, I would, I would see this this girl that I would say was my friend. So she wasn't corporeal, but I think I had some, you know, psychic ability. I did have psychic abilities. So I would see this girl that I would kind of would give me comfort and she would be like with me. And I said that, you know, in my innocence. So, you know, there was a time when my uncle put me, the facility had a bunch of rooms and they had uh, two or three walls that were completely glass so that the scientists could watch you know, what was going on in there. All the rooms had drain holes on the floor with hoses to hose off 
you know, blood and, and guts. This particular room had a, had a ceiling to floor fan, big fan. Anyway, he had said if I did something, he would bring the, a girl to play with me. And so I was all excited and I saw him walking down the hall with a, a, a girl towards the room. And right before they got there, the fan went on and he pushed her through. And so she splattered all over me. Um, and I'm sorry, it's, I know this is really horrific, but this is what they do. Um, and that was to show me, you know, I'll never have anyone. I'll never uh, have comfort. I'll never have a relationship. He inculcated in me that it's my fault that all these people die. And I did believe that for a while. Um, he would capture gypsies because in Rome, they're undocumented. So there's going to be, you know, no one's going to miss them. He would kidnap them and bring them into the facility and do all kinds of tortures and things. And so there was another uh, point where he brought, he had captured this woman who had two twin babies. And um, I was supposed to go through this long obstacle course and figure out how to get from here to the other side with the babies in my arms. And the, the it's hard to describe, it's like a long rectangular room with windows. So the mother would be looking through the window and I would be like, have to go through a pit filled with cockroaches or like, you know, these, these things and climb things. And basically he said, if you make it to the end with the two babies, then I'll give them back to the woman. So that was my motivation. I was like, I'm gonna save these babies. Well, at the end, it opened into this huge aviary um, I mean, you know, stories high and there were vultures there in there. And of course they had been not fed. So by the time I got to the end exhausted, I could not prevent the vultures from, um, from getting the babies, you know, and, and tearing them to pieces. So, yeah. So again, then he would tell me, well, you know, it's your fault. You could have saved them and, and, and you didn't. Um, there would be experiments of impossible choices. So he had this bigger room, again, still with the drain hole and just empty concrete room. And he brought in like 10 or 12 um, people, they're gypsies. And that one was a little girl with her mom and the rest were adults. And he had a gun and a desk there. And he said to me, um, you either shoot one of them or I'm going to shoot all of them. Right. So I said, no, I don't, I'm not going to kill anyone. And he said, he would pick up the gun and say, well, I'm going to start shooting him. And I said, no, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll shoot one, you know? And then I was going to shoot one person. He said, you have to shoot that one. And it was the mother. And I, I thought, no, you know? So anyway, I thought, okay, I I'm going to, I'm going to do it because I want to save the other people. Again, this impossible choice. So I shot her and then for daughter's face, you know, and I, 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 I couldn't bear it. So I mercy, I shot the daughter too, just like to, for me, it was an act of mercy. And, um, you know, then he said, Oh, you, you did it wrong. You failed. And then he took the gun and shot them all anyway, you know, and, you know, would lock me in the room again overnight um, with all of them and the, their blood kind of draining down into the, the, the drain hole in the center. Um, so things like this, you know, they're experiments to break me to, um, and he would tell me, um, you're going to, I'm going to make you just like me. Um, I'm going to make you just like us. You're, you're, you, and then he would say, you're a killer. You killed, you know, even though yeah, <laughs> it was I, set up that I, way. And, um, but I have to tell you, Emma, when I heard him say, I'm going to make you just like me, something in me vowed, I, it, it was like a, a steel core that developed in me. And I was like, no, never. And he shouldn't have said that because that was something that kept me going. And I, I used everything that I had 
to stay alive and to get through that and to never turn to the dark. So he made a great mistake in telling me that that actually became like this little core of me that was really, really strong and kept me going because I said, no, I will never, you know. Oh my gosh, that's so horrific to think about. And then witnessing that like at any age, you know, but a child and then thinking about just how, like you said, how ruthless and vile your uncle was to just, you know, be so psychotic that he has no shame in doing any of this. You know, were there other children there besides you or was this just something that he did with you? Well, he did it with me, but he sometimes had other children there. Um, there was this little boy that was older than me that he had brought in, again, a gypsy boy. And uh, he, we were in one of the rooms and the guys were watching and he said to the, he gave the boy a gun and he said, um, you either kill her or I'm going to kill you. And I remember he was sobbing and crying and I was like right there with him. And I, I said to him, you know, it's okay. Like you can go ahead and, and shoot me, you know, like do whatever you need to do. And then he was saying, no, I, I can't do it. And so he refused. He threw the gun across the room. And then my uncle came in and um, asked for a knife and, and just sliced his neck open. But when he was dying, he was looking at me and I was looking at him. And I understood in that moment that he had just graduated because he had made the right choice. He he wasn't going to do that. Um, so that was kind of, I tried to hang on to any kernel of hope that I could. And often in the facility with the people that he was killing or torturing, I would lock eyes with them and I would like connect with my heart just because I, I had this idea that I don't want them to die alone or thinking, you know, so I would do my best to have little moments of connection within that horrific uh, reality. Oh my goodness. It reminds me of this, um, this one book that I read before called Man's Search for Meaning by a guy named Victor L. Frankel. And he yeah. talks about that. And it, that book really changed my life because, you know, we go through life and we suffer and, and obviously you suffered on this whole different level, but he, for people who never read that book, he experienced life in the Holocaust and was at a concentration camp and was one of the few that lived through concentration camp after concentration camp and later wrote a book about this exact thing that Max is talking about, where he said, I had to find a meaning in my suffering. I had never been challenged to do that before, you know, like usually we just sulk in our suffering, it passes, but what, what about when it doesn't, you know, what about when you're just in this perpetual cycle of suffering and he would notice the people that gave up hope and didn't have that thing, that, that little morsel to hold on to, he could almost predict he would die in the concentration camp, you know, and so he had to find a meaning in his suffering. And he said, you know, we have to find just as much meaning in our suffering as we do in the things that are good, you know, and he gave this quote and I'll read it. It says between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is a power to choose our response and our response lies our growth and our freedom, you know? So even if it's just that morsel, like that morsel eventually led to your freedom, it was something that you could hang on to, even though it was so vile, like you have this murder or this psycho telling you that you're going to be just like him, you know, and, and somehow that, at such a young age, you held on to you and were like, I'm going to, this is going to be my motivation when I don't want to keep going. I'm going to hold on to this. And I'm going to remember that I'm never going to be like him, you know? And I love that you brought that up. Cause I, I think that's what survivors do. You know, you find those morsels. You guys are so good at finding just that little flicker, that little star in the dark and hanging on to it for dear life you know, and, and thank God that you did, you know, thank God he said those words to you and that they elicited that response. Cause I think for people that didn't take that, you know, it could have done the opposite and like really propelled them into, into darkness further. Yeah. Yeah. Actually. And another moment, like a little moment of victory for me, there was a time when the, you know, the facility was under the ground and they had this like big sort of, I don't know, heating duct and 
it was being repaired in, in, and there was this one kind of utility room and I saw that it was being repaired. So it was open and he had just brought in some, some gypsies that he had kidnapped. There were um, three or four adults and he walked away for a minute and I saw my opportunity. So I said to them, come run. And I, and I, so I showed them the duct and they went and climbed up it and I was behind them and we were able to get to the, the, there was like a van, white van parking lot up on the top. So it was very nondescript. And I knew because I'd been taken there so much that there was a part of the chain link fence that was uh, um, dislodged from the bottom. So they made it out and I pointed to the fence and they got out. They actually escaped. And then he was coming out from the front and running towards me. And then I turned and ran towards him because, you know, there was no way for me to escape, right? So, but I felt so good that I had let three of them escape. And shortly after he kidnapped this gypsy that was um, an older woman, she was kind of like a grandma. And I remember like her skirts and everything. And um, she came, she was in the facility and he sometimes, you know, would do tortures where people would, I would sit across a desk from someone. And um, she told me in a moment, uh, she said, I, I, I heard about you. She said, you helped my people. And she told me that I was an angel. So that was another moment. And then that's actually when my uncle had me say the stuff in the tape recorder. He had her and he was going to rip off her fingernails one by one if I didn't repeat what he said into the tape recorder. And she said to me, don't say it, don't say it. But I but I did because I couldn't bear for, for her to suffer. And so that was a moment of connection. Of course, at the end, he shot her in the head right in front of me um, because we had bonded, right? So, but I had opportunities and, and others, you know, where in one minute or five minutes, I could form a bond because we were in this nightmare hell together, right? And I did, I felt responsible because he was my uncle, you know, and he was doing, he was doing things to me that involved people because he knew, he figured out pretty quickly, it was much more effective to hurt other people that, that destroyed me much more than just hurting me, right? Um, but to answer your question from earlier, there were other children, particularly, so sometimes I would, there was a room where he had cages. So I'd be put in a cage and there would be other kids sometimes. And we would be taken to these elite parties. So if you ever saw that old movie, Eyes Wide Shut, I, I had to run out of the theater, but I saw enough to recognize they, they do these parties like this, all fancy and black tie. And then they would bring me and the other kids in a, in a, in a bus or something. And um, sometimes like if it was this kind of fancy party, we would be all dressed up and there would be, you know, different ages and boys and girls. And then the people at the party, these elites would pick um, pedophiles like a specific age or race or gender. So they would just select us and then, you know, take up, take us to these rooms and, and do, you know, rape the kids or whatever they wanted to do. Um, sometimes there would be these outdoor parties like on grounds. So there would be some trees and some nature and they would sometimes strip the kids naked or sometimes um, put on like some certain costumes. And then we were to run and hide in the woods because it was a hunting party and we, the children, were the ones hunted. And so it was terrifying because you knew inevitably they would find you, you know. And at the end of the evening, they, they would have this big party table and they would always take at least one child and, um, you know, sacrifice that child. Um, I witnessed at one of these parties, um, they somebody had a very long old fashioned sword and they took two babies and basically impaled them on the sword alive and then were swinging it around. And I want to emphasize that they think they were laughing and drinking and doing drugs. And this was um, 
fun for these people. Yeah. Absolutely horrific, you know, and, and your story validates so many other people who have said these things that just seem so out there, you know, human hunting, you know, it's like, we make movies number one at the box office about that, you know, it's that one movie called um, The Hunger Games. You know, yeah. that's essentially like a human hunting entertainment. People are in the theater eating popcorn. You know, it's like they're mimicking that. And it's so sick, you know, but and then, of course, it it brainwashes people to think, well, that that can't happen in real life. And it's like, yes, it is, you know, and at, at these really big estates, you know, people's massive yards and these these properties that people drive by and Google at and say, gosh, I wish I was that rich and I could live there, not knowing that right in the backyard, you know, there's there's children on just being, you know, just the most vile things being done to children in those woods, you know? So I appreciate you sharing these really hard things, Max. This isn't, I know it's not easy to talk about, and I'm so sorry that you had to bear witness to all of this, you know, but your, your voice is speaking on behalf of them. Like their deaths aren't in vain if you are able to shine a light on it. And so I appreciate yeah. you talking about it because it is really hard. Now, why were, yeah. why were you chosen for this to begin with? So you obviously you know, you had this in your family. Did you have siblings or like, what was it? Why did you become a chosen one for all of this? I don't know um, why particularly me, my siblings were sometimes included um, in the, in the tortures. Like there was a, in one of the facility rooms, um, there was a, he had brought my sister who was maybe a, a toddler at the time. And he had this, um, this, see-through tank with with water in it and a burner underneath and then he had me on the other side of the room and I had to put on this suit that had like pockets where you could put weights in there so I was completely weighted down and then he turned the burner on and he said if you can get to her um, before the water boils you can save her and somehow I did it I was, I overcame the extra weight and I was able to get there and take my sister out. And that might seem fantastic to people, but see, the human being can develop any level of endurance or, or skills if you have to. So I had to, and so I did, you know? Um, I had self-healing ability in my childhood. So, you know, once he, he hammered and broke all my bones and then they would study this and I would be able to fix my body within a certain period of time. Um, I believe we all have this self-healing ability, but we've been manipulated and lied to and conditioned to think that there's this outer boogeyman called germs that can harm us and that we have to look to this authority figure called a doctor to give us a pill or a vaccine to fix us. But that's not true. I believe we all inherently have a self-healing ability and the norm is health and balance, but our world has been poisoned, the, the air, the chemtrails, the water, the food, you know, you name it. So our condition now is, is very ill and weak, which is where these people want us. But I believe everybody has this self-healing ability. So sometimes he would use, never my brother. Um, so just sometimes my sister with me, sometimes my mom. Um, yeah, so it kind of depended. Um, and I just want to mention kind of a last piece of, Kind of the darker things I want to describe. Um, you know, I was trafficked, so I was given to different elites, um, and I would go to stay. They would I would be at their homes for I don't know how many days, and I remember that feeling of just not knowing when I was going to be able to get back and get out of there. And that has carried into adulthood where I've only in the last year conquered that. I, Whenever I traveled and stayed in hotels or Airbnbs, I wouldn't be able to sleep. I would have panic attacks all night because I was in an unfamiliar place. Eventually I realized what that was and I, I've been able to actually overcome that. Um, but 
A last thing I'll say is um, in terms of the, the sexual abuse, the rape, the trafficking, um, he had done a, a bonfire ritual with me when I was 14 at night. Um, and they brought in cages of animals and this huge fire. And I was laid on a blanket and drugged with a drug where I was fully conscious, but I couldn't move a muscle. I couldn't even talk. And, uh, you know, then he had me basically gang raped by a whole lot of men. And every rape would coincide with an animal being thrown into the fire. So I would hear the screaming and smell the burning flesh. And um, out of this event and others, by the time I reached that age, um, I became impregnated a few times. And so my uncle, by the way, always had this guy that was just called the doctor with him. And I would be drugged and, and he was part of the experiments too. And they would wait till I was almost at term and then do a ritualized abortion. And so one of them was at the doctor's home. He had a courtyard and he had a, um, some fig trees. And so I was um, nailed to the fig tree Jesus style and electrodes were on my breasts and my genitals and I was pretty pregnant. And then my family was made to be eating, it was Easter, my family was be made to be eating lunch at an outside table. So again, that kind of like the church, you know, kind of like, and I was there for a while and I was just sweating. I couldn't move because the nails were ripping into my hands. And then they took me down and took me into the bathroom and put me in a tub of ice water and handcuffed me to both. They had the two faucets handcuffed me and the doctor gave me an injection. And then a little bit later and they left. And then I, I, I felt this pain and saw blood in the water and this tiny baby float up. And I was able to free this hand and scoop it out of the water, just like made eye contact, you know, for a few seconds before he died. Um, and so that's kind of, there's many, many more things, but I just wanted to share that one because these people, they, ha they, they have young girls, young women, and they're captive. They're kept underground their whole lives. Um, and they're used as breeders. So they can, they will have, impregnate them. They will have these babies. And these are the babies that will be used in the rituals, the babies that will be, um, you know, offered to Lucifer, the babies that will be cooked and eaten. And um, so I just wanted to mention that because that is a factor in what these people do. And, um, you know, something interesting is I hadn't remembered that memory. Um, I was pregnant with my daughter. I have a daughter who's 20 now. And when I went to give birth, um, it was like 26 hours and I was pushing for four hours and she wouldn't come out. And there was no reason. In retrospect, it was my body remembering and saying, I'm not letting this one out because they're going to kill it, you know? And so I ended up having to have a cesarean. And then, you know, I was in the hospital room and I remember the nurses trying to convince me to put her in that little seat, you know, plastic bassinet on wheels. And I was like, no, I had to have her on my body. And then they took her to do the, I don't know, whatever they do, the washing and the like stuff. And Within minutes that they took her, I started to have a huge panic attack and I was screaming. And my husband was like, what, what? And I was like, she's dead, she's dead. They took her, they killed her. Now, I didn't remember that incident. I didn't even know why I was saying that, right? And so they, you know, they rushed her back and I basically, you know, I wore her for the first year of my life. I quit my job and I raised her full time and she's an incredible human being today and, and, and basically the love of my life. But um, I wanted to illustrate that because, you know, so I have my baby now and she's safe and she's never been harmed and she's had love and she's had two good parents. And, you know, so I'm very grateful for that. But I just thought that was an important last piece to share because they they do this, you know, unfortunately, I've 
talk to other survivors who had who have had forced abortions at term. Absolutely. You know, and that is a question that I've had people ask me a lot is like, okay, if they're doing this, where, where does the supply of babies come from? You know, and that is one way it's very similar to what they do with dogs. You know, they, they have dogs that they pick because their genetic bloodlines are so pure and they can produce these show dogs, these perfect, you know, picture perfect puppies that, you know, have cognitive abilities, physical abilities, you know, and they, humans have that same thing in, in these people's eyes. Like there's a superiority chain of hierarchy and how they view humanity. And most of humanity is the scum of the earth. But then there's these few people that are in these, you know, these, these cults, like what you grew up in, who are the elite, who are the ones that have the superior bloodlines and the ones that they want to keep in captivity and breed because they're, they're going to match them up with the perfect genetic, you know, makeup that's going to, elicit the best response for something like a, you know, whether it's a super soldier, somebody that goes into the programs, whether it's a sex slave or whether it's a sacrifice, you know, the, the perfect concoction of this, like Nathan Reynolds, another survivor, he calls it radical, intelligent evil. And that's exactly what it is. Like it is evil, but it's not in the way that is seen in movies where it's like this careless, random evil. Like it's a very scientific thousands of years old, systemic, organized, orchestrated evil that is actually intelligent in those ways just like how we see like I said with with dogs you know that's intelligent too to be able to to breed dogs in a certain way that's going to give you the the perfect puppy for whatever it is that you know they want that dog to do you know so I do appreciate you saying that because I think with especially you know um the female aspect obviously like that is something that almost you know, I would say almost every female that I've had on the show has gone through it. And I've even had males on my show who are like, Hey, I was used as a male breeder. You know, my genetics were what they wanted. And unfortunately, like, that's what I was used for, you know, and, and it is like, it's so horrific to think of that, you know, and then to look in the real world and say, you know, that's basically what they've now made it, they brought that into the real world and introduced it to us. And they made it legal in certain states, you know, and, and really like, it's a satanic ritual that society is participating in at these Planned Parenthood, you know, facilities and stuff, you know, and again, like, where do those babies go? Right. And so there's, it's a whole rabbit hole. So I really appreciate you shining a light on that, Max. Like that is a huge piece of this puzzle. That's a big part of these missing children. You know, where are they going after they're in CPS or whether, you know, like these women that are held underground just to be breeders, you know, this is a really big deal. And there's so many lives that are just held in captivity. Those women, you know, imagine a life where that's all that you're used for. And then these children, you know, and, and none of their voices are heard. So you're giving a voice to so many people by sharing this, these absolute horrors that you had to participate in. Yeah. And, you know, it, I think you make a good point. So I want to sort of highlight that Everything we see out there that's done to animals, like cows and pigs and chickens are kept in all on top of one another. They're, they're raised in a life of torment and torture, and then they're brutally killed for their meat. It's a parallel, okay? They do this to human beings. They see us normal human beings as cattle, as um, useless eaters. They want to kill off the ones that are not you know, that's why during the last few years, there was a campaign to, you know, put the thing in the body of the elderly first and the handicap. They, uh, the genetic experiments that they've done with plants and with animals, they have always been doing on us. That thing was a genetic experiment um, and they've done them in the past. So that's nothing new. So even you can even say that like a, a country would be like a ranch and the people are like the cattle and they they feel like they're free. They're roaming around eating the grass, but they have fences around. And yeah, they're being fed and taken care of because they serve a purpose, right? So every horrible thing that's out there that's done to animals, you it's then maybe less hard to believe that this is also done to human beings behind the scenes, right? So I just wanted to sort of highlight that. Um, Thank you for bringing yeah. it up. The stuff's hard to hear, but it's reality and it's still happening. You know, there's still women being impregnated and held in, you know, these underground bunkers for till term just to have their babies killed as soon as it comes out of their body. You know, like it's, it's terrifying and it's horrible. And yes. so for you, Max, 
you know, and I don't, I don't want you to have to talk about anything else really difficult if you don't want to, but where does, where does this story start to take a turn? What age were you when, when you maybe separated from this or how did you get out of this in a sense? And I hate saying get out because I don't feel like a survivor ever does. Like there's always, you know, whether it's technological warfare, whatever, you know, like these people, they're, they're relentless in trying to keep you as their property, you know, however they can. But when did the story start to shift for you or maybe you, you separated from your uncle or how did you get away from this? So, you know, my parents divorced when I was 14 and then I was full time in Rome. So he had access to me sometimes during the year and then up and then from 14 to 18 all the time. However, because my dad is American, it was always the plan that I would come to university in the U.S. I always went to American schools abroad. So that was one factor. And my dad was... My dad was a very depressed, very absent person. And so he either didn't know or maybe was done to, to to dissociate him. I don't know, but he was never able to protect me or anything like that. However, I think that there wasn't anything that my uncle could do about sending me, about me coming to the US. So when I was 18 in 1982, I did come here. Now, prior to that, there was another event where it was another ritual he was doing. It was outside. I was supposed to carry a big cross like Jesus. And then I looked up and my sister was hanging from a tree by her ankle. And I had, I just, at that point, something in me, I, I, I couldn't do it anymore. So I, I stopped and I threw the cross down. And this anger came out of me, this power came out of me, and it was my uncle and some priests, and there, there was a dusty road, and the dust started to swirl, almost like I was drawing up a small tornado. There was, there was this, this movement in, the, in the, the dust and the air, and they actually sort of went off the ground just a teeny bit, and I saw fear in my uncle's eyes and in the other guys that were there. And this just, I, I feel like it's some, it was God coming through me or just my higher self or just that part of me that, you know, we're so powerful and then we're in this human body and we feel powerless. But I just said, I'm done. I said, you will not touch me. You will not touch my sister. You will not touch my mother. And I just, this, this voice just came out of me with this power. And I and and without knowing why I said it, I said, because you know otherwise what I can do. And I believe that that had something to do with it. It was like I was able to step into some other part of myself and I drew a line. And see, there's a there are some universal laws which the dark kind of doesn't obey a lot of them, but they do need our consent to do these satanic things and not saying no is implied consent. So when the human population, like when they did the satanic ritual called COVID-19, most people complied and therefore they could do it. If people say no, that is revoking consent is our power, right? So I think in that moment, I revoked my consent. I just said no more. And I remember at my graduation from high school in Rome, he came and he gave me this like leather full binder thing, like, you know, where you put like, it's, it's I don't know what to call it, but he, I opened it up and he had to pick some pictures and he said, um, you're a killer and you'll always be a killer. So he tried at the, at the end to, you know, try and like keep me imprisoned within my own self, but I left and I remember being on the airplane flying from Italy to the US, this overwhelming sense of like freedom and like relief. And I was like, oh my God, I'm I'm out of there, you know? So I came to the US, I went to college um, and I studied psychology, which obvious reasons, right? Um, and my first job was at a psychiatric hospital and I worked on a unit with really psychotic and schizophrenic patients. 
And I became the one that they would call to soothe agitated patients. They had these big burly guys, you know, that if they needed to subdue people, but I wasn't scared, you know, with everything I'd seen, that was, <laughs> you know, that was nothing to me. And I, I had this ability to see the real person, the soul of the person behind the mental illness. And I actually loved that job. And so that began my healing because I finally could do something. I had seen my uncle do all these horrors to people and I had, I was helpless. And now here I could help people. And then I worked with uh, homeless, um, crack addicted folks in the inner city in DC. It was a community mental health center. And they were supposedly access one diagnosis along with an addiction, but after a little while, I began to see, and I told my, my boss, I said, these people are traumatized. They're not crazy. They have trauma. So actually, she listened to me and began to look at it differently. And um, we ended up co-writing a, um, a manual for how to do trauma work, group work with this particular population and you know presented at conferences and everything and then she sent me to be to get training in trauma so by then i was about 25 so i got some really good with the best people at that time so now my training was really in trauma i went back to school and i got a masters degree in psychology and then eventually i did a doctorate um but then i would work um i ran a batterers program after that so it was men who had been arrested for committing domestic violence and they could choose jail or my six month uh, men's group. So they took a chance hiring a young female to run this. It ended up being amazing because I, I had had scary men in my life and suddenly I was working with what, what are labeled scary men, but I began to understand that these guys had gone through so much trauma themselves you know, and masculinity is its own prison in society. And they, they had been abused and couldn't really ever talk about it. And so it was a combination of that. And then me teaching them, um, you know, all kinds of skills and things. And eventually, by the end of the six months, all the guys wanted to keep going in the group. They begged me and I was like, I, I, I can't, I have to do another group, but you guys can continue together. And they would tell me that the environment with those other guys was the, the, the deepest intimacy that they had ever experienced. And, you know, in, in group one, they were all, you know, I said, we're going to go around and you're going to say the incident that got you arrested or any other domestic violence incident that you did. And, you know, they would say, oh, no, she made me do it. And, and I would say, look, you know, we have to break through the denial. It's just like addictions. That's the first symptom. You're going to do that or I'll call your probation officer and you'll go back. So I had to be a little strict in the beginning. But as we went along, it really shifted. And I had their wives and girlfriends bringing me flowers and cakes, you know, and I loved doing that. I loved it. And I learned that both men and women were all abused by these people societally. We all come from some kind of trauma. And again, being able to help men who had scared me before heal and transform was a huge part of my healing. Um, I then worked in rape crisis centers. I worked with abused, abused children and I worked in the, in the prisons and in the jails. Um, and in, I worked in the San Francisco jail uh, mental health unit um, once I had moved to the West Coast and, and done my doctorate work. And there was this young kid, he was 19, and he had come from a family of drug addicts. So he had been sexually abused by all the people coming in and out of the home, had run away, ended up on the streets of San Francisco and was basically selling himself for sex. A guy had picked him up. They had done drugs together. The guy had asked him to drive his car and the kid crashed killed someone and so not the guy who hired him for sex but he ended up in jail as usually is the case and this kid you know in the in the mental health unit um that people weren't treated very well i insisted on taking people out and having them in the room 
and doing actually therapy with them. And this young man, I realized they had diagnosed him as bipolar. They were medicating him. And I realized, oh my God, no, he's a trauma survivor. And with time, he, he really, really healed. He went off his meds and then he was ready to be released. And before he left, he told me that he was going to study to become a counselor and help other kids such as himself, right? So I just give these examples to say that was a huge piece of my healing because I was able to do something and help people. And there was nothing too dark or scary, obviously, for me to to hear. <laughs> you know, I'd been through it all myself. Um, I had gone into therapy uh, during those years, but never quite dug down to the more horrific memories. I was those ask you that, like, what were you aware of? Because you hadn't remembered everything yet. Did you sort of remember like some sexual abuse and just some, yeah, yeah. I remembered some sexual abuse. I thought it was just in the family. Um, I remembered the the violence, the you know, the my mother being very unstable and crazy, my father being very absent, that kind of stuff. But the the rituals and the facility, I didn't remember. I had things though, like I was claustrophobic. I couldn't be anywhere that was underground. Um, certain things triggered me. I just didn't know why. Uh, so it's interesting. The body does remember. Um, it took uh, getting pregnant with my daughter and then having her. And once she was born, you know, I couldn't work and I didn't know why, but I had to be with her all the time. I didn't trust her with anybody else. And it, when she was about four, the memories started to break through. They started to come out in nightmares. So I would have nightmares, like I described the animal section of the facility. So I had a nightmare where I was in a shopping, uh, a, a grocery store, and you know, the um, produce section where they have like boxes, they have apples or whatever, whatever. In the dream, there were animals being tortured in the supermarket instead of the produce. Well, that was a literal, that led to the literal memory. I would wake up screaming, sweating. I would have to change all my bedding. Um, sometimes I would run to the bathroom and not make it. So my body would just be in it, the, the, the memory, the, the nightmare was so severe that like I would pee myself. Um, so being trained, you know, and uh, having trained in psychology, I thought, okay, I better get someone to help me here. Something's happening. And I was able to find a therapist. She was very non-traditional. She was actually a master's in divinity, but she had heard about ritual abuse. Now I still hadn't heard about ritual abuse. I didn't know that, that was, there was a name for what had been done to me. Um, but so I ended up, she was, bless her heart, ended up talking to me. It was on the phone which ended up being perfect because I think face-to-face -face would have been too threatening for me. Um, and she was ended up talking to me every day, which you don't do as a therapist, but she recognized because for me, it was like when the vault opened, it's different for other people. It's different for everyone. They were just shooting out. The memories were just coming out um, at night in nightmares or during the day. So when I would talk with her, she would just say, like I was, imagine that I'm sitting in a movie theater and looking at a screen, and then I would just look at the blank screen, and then within a few minutes, something would start to, to be there. And I would start to sob and cry or scream, or this rage would come out of me. I would sweat so badly. So my body was releasing, my emotions were releasing, and I was putting together pieces, memories, and all of a sudden, little by little, everything in my life started to make sense because it had been like a puzzle with chunks missing, right? And um, that's actually also when a suicide program opened up in me. I had been programmed that if I ever told, I should kill myself. And I've said this to you before, I think, where I would go to the train station and, and the train would come and the voice in me would say, jump, jump, you know, and I just wouldn't. And then I get back in my car and drive home. And so there was, it was really brutal to recover the memories, to feel the emotions, 
to be so suicidal until I overcame it. And I've talked with other survivors about this. I, I felt crazy for a while because I'm, I was like, well, how can I not have remembered these things? Like, I don't even know who I am, you know, but it took 10 years, but little by little, all the story, you know, and I had to put together the, the narrative. I had to feel the emotions and my body had, I would, I would tremble. I would sweat. I would throw up. And eventually everything kind of settled and I was able to kind of step out into a whole new person and free of all of that. And so, yeah, so that was kind of that therapy was sort of like a really significant process. And during that time, I picked up boxing, which later became kickboxing and, and Muay Thai because of the rage and because I had been created, there had been altars in me. One was like a warrior. So I needed, and I still do that. So I need to do that kind of fighting. It really helped me process that. And also my body who had not been able to fight back now could finish that motion. Um, so that helped um, being able to raise my daughter with love and protection and just, in, you know, just have her. Um, I've always had pets. Um, I love being out in nature. And I became really good at observing my own thinking and my triggers because I suddenly would get triggered by something and I learned, okay, that always leads to a past memory. So when I would be triggered, instead of reacting to the person in front of me, I would, I began to know better and I would like, you know, remove myself from the situation and just sit and then it would lead back to something in my past. So after the therapy, that's how I've continued to like pull out pieces that are still in there. And um, I do a whole process where I retrieve that child part and I've created a metaphysical, beautiful house with like, uh, there's a beach and there's dolphins in the water and there's elephant nannies and there's forest because I love trees. So each part that I retrieve, I put in this beautiful space. So I take them out of the past. And, um, you know, little by little, I'm, I'm so much better today. I still have little things, but I used to be so scared inside all the time. Like when I would go to bed at night, I would start to think somebody broke into the house and I would have to compulsively get up and check all the windows and the door to make sure they were locked, even though I knew that they were because I had done it. And I was just always, I couldn't sleep at night. Now I sleep. Um, so many things in my life are better. I was always scared that my daughter would be kidnapped or something would happen. And, you know, last year she went to Europe with some friends and they traveled together and I was okay. You know, so I watch and I'm so grateful for the progress that I keep making and the things that don't grab me or, or have me anymore. That's so amazing and so inspiring for people who, you know, are on the other end thinking, oh my gosh, I can't even get out of bed, much less think about creating something or or having, you know, a normal day or not feeling like this, you know, and, and I love that you're able to express that, hey, it's not perfect, like this is a lifetime thing, but if you keep putting one foot in front of the other, if you keep going inch by inch, it might seem like it's so slow. You know, you said a decade, you know, until you really started to feel, you know, pretty healed and, and, you know, we're able to kind of step into that power again and take back those, those triggers and not be affected anymore, you know, and that can seem like a long time for people, but like, if you just keep going, you know, just keep going. And there's so many resources available now that I'm sure even whenever you woke up to all of this, were really hard to find. At what point did you think, I need to speak out about this? Like, I need to start telling people my story. You know, it was just really a couple of years ago because I I was sort of angry with God and I was saying, you know, people need to know. And then I heard, well, then tell them. And I thought, what, me? Like, I'm, I'm shy. And I was watched with, you know, in the facility. I, I had such a trauma about being on camera but I've learned in my life to follow that voice. You know, it may not make sense, but there's 
you know, so I would have never, if you had asked me 10 years ago, I would have laughed in your face that I would, you know, that I'd be on camera talking about this, but here I am. So I first started uh, with a video and, and kind of told my story. And then it evolved into interviewing other survivors. And then I created, you know, I thought I'm unbroken. You know, I was broken, but we can all unbreak ourselves and put ourselves back together. So I I chose the name and then it became also interviewing healers and people who have solutions and all that. And um, oh yeah, and a new website is almost ready. So it's gonna look a lot better than this. I have a new one coming out. Um, yeah, so I, I interview a lot of survivors. Um, there are uh, truth warriors that I interview. I call them truth warriors. They're people who expose different aspects of the control structure. Um, and then healers and teachers who talk about different modalities of healing, um, dimensions, you know, how we can raise our frequency, um, all these kinds of things. So that then has been the last, not the last, but the part that I'm doing now. Um, and this has been, again, so amazing for me because I have met these incredible people. Some of these survivors like Rachel, who's there and, and Doug and Jeanette and Kathy O'Brien and um, Mary Sparrow and others are all friends of mine now. And um, and some of the truth warriors, you know, I interviewed Mark Passio and um, Dale Holmes and David Whitehead and other people and Penny Kelly and people like that. Um, so it's under interviews under truth warriors, but um, it's been so amazing to find all these people. Every one of these people is doing their part. They're doing something to change the situation that we're in. Dr. Tess Laurie I interviewed recently. She's amazing. She's in the UK. She has this thing called the World Council for Health, and they're exposing all of the medical stuff that's going on. Um, so I'm privileged to know all of these human beings and the wonderful things that they're doing. Um, and actually, Emma, the uh, I'll send you the invite. It's almost ready, but um, I'm going to have a summit uh, December 1st through 10th at the end of this year. And a bunch of these people are going to be speaking. And my goal is to have all these brilliant people, survivors and truth tellers and healers come together in one forum. And it's the, the theme is mind control, healing and recovery. And how do we go forward? What can we co-create out there in the world that's better and different than the than what we have right now. And so I'll I'll be sharing that with you and and you know if you want to share it with other people but it's a great opportunity to come together. Each uh speaker will have 30 minutes of live Q&A after so people will be able to interact with all these folks. And I want to bring all these people together like my nanny in Africa said. Um I'll meet all these stars that have come to the planet. And I want to bring everyone together on the last day, all these brilliant people so they can meet each other because we're going to form a global community of healed people who speak the truth, who are here to help others and do their work and understand what's going on out there to make correct choices. And a lot of these folks are co-creating all kinds of new ways forward. Um, so I'm really excited for that. So that's kind of the next thing um, upcoming on my list. Oh my gosh, this is so incredible. Everything that you've done. I love hearing this and you're so right. I say that too. You know, we can sit here and complain about the world, how it is and how this Luciferian kingdom, you know, has formed against our will in a sense um, around us by the powers that be. Or we can get up and create the world that we want and just stop participating in all this nonsense that they've created for us. You know, like if we all just decided to stop paying our taxes, there's nothing that they could do yes. about it. If we all stepped Absolutely. up, you know, don't go to work or don't do this, or we're going to take away this supply, or you have to buy electric cars, whatever it is, you have to take this medication. And we all just said, no, we're not, you know, they couldn't do anything about it, you know? And this is like such a beautiful way to rebel against 
against uh you know the the powers that are trying to bring us down by saying all right well i'm not going to join you i'm going to create the world that i wish i lived in you know and i'm going to find yes. the other people who want to create it with me and we're going to overcome all your darkness cuz the light always wins you know and i yes. love that you're doing that and bringing these people together and even the story about your nanny you're 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 painting the sky that she created you're going to bring that into life you know all these stars all together you're going to bring them together and bring her vision together in real life. I think that's so amazing, Max. Thank you. And you know, the thing is, um, we are more powerful than them. We, the light does always win. And the real secret here is that they're scared to death of us, okay? They are scared of us because we have the power of the true power of the light. You know, I often compare God to the sun and Lucifer to the moon. So the moon appears to have its own light, but it's actually a reflection of the light of the sun. Everything that was created on this earth that's beautiful was created by us, okay? And they can't create because they're they're severed. They don't, we're like in the image of God, so we're also many creators. They don't have that ability, so they need us to work through us to create what we see out there. So here's the secret they don't want us to know. If we decide we're not going to create for them the dark things that they want, we don't have to. We can create something different, something light. We, if we do our healing work, if we know the, what's out there, we're not manipulated mentally anymore. We so-called free our mind from the matrix because it is a matrix, right? then we are unstoppable. They don't stand a chance. There's also a lot more of us than them. And I believe, Emma, that this is actually happening. Um, there's more light coming in. Consciousness is rising. Every negative thing they do is waking people up. 9-11, which they did, you know, it's, it was a sacrifice. 9-11 is one of their sacrificial days. They blew up those towers. That woke people up. COVID woke people up. Now climate change, that agenda is waking people up. So it's interesting to me. I think God has a sense of humor because all they're, you know, they're trying to mess with the food supply and, and kill cattle and all this stuff. Well, guess what? People are now growing their own food in their gardens. So everything they do is backfiring spectacularly if you look at it with the right eyes. And I see that they're they're done. Their narrative is collapsing. Their structures are collapsing. They have harvested off us etherically. They have harvested off us physically. As you alluded to, taxation is theft. It's not even legal what to, to take part of our income. People are waking up to that. So all it takes is us being healed, being whole, and almost like holding hands around the world, coming together and saying, you know what? No, thanks. I don't want to participate in your hellscape that you've created. I'm going to go over here and we can create different kinds of schools. We can grow our own food. We can return to real natural medicine, which exists in a lot of places. We can do more of that. We can have wholesome, we can clean up the water. I mean, we can we can stop letting the letting them divide and conquer us. Everything's a program. Oh, well, it's racial or it's gender or it's sexual orientation, like or religion. No, forget it. We're all one human race. So we've got this. And I think it's actually happening. So that's what I'm excited about. And so I'm going to do everything I can to help people heal, help people see what's really going on so they can make a different choice. And, you know, people have said to me, are you scared they might like kill you? And I said, no, I, I will die a happy woman if, I mean, even now I feel like I've done enough that I'm satisfied, you know, but I'm just going to keep going because why else am I here, you know, and everyone is here to do this, whether they remember it or not. And when you heal yourself, you'll remember who you really are. And like you said, you know, in the beginning, you chose this life, not because of what you had to go through to learn the lessons that you know now, but because you knew that you would learn these lessons that a lot of people don't get to and that you'd share it with the world and create the world that that doesn't exist, that you would be a part of that movement. 
And you're so brave for stepping up to do that. I am so inspired by you. You know, these stories, I'm not a survivor of these things. So for me, I'm like, the least I can do is just listen and share. But you've gone through so many things, like you're shouldering your own story and your own trauma, you know, and granted, you've come such a long way in your healing, but you could easily just have been satisfied with that. And instead you're saying, I'm now that I'm lighter, I've, I've gotten rid of some of my weight and I've integrated it and healed it. I'm going to now start shouldering other people's stories and, and shining a light on other people's stories. And I think that's so wonderful, Max. I love what you've done with your podcast. And, you know, I always say survivors are going to change the world, you know, and like, these are the stories that we need to listen to everybody, even like some of the most awakened people that I know, they're still watching their political influencers, watching politicians, watching the people that run the nonprofits and the businesses get up, you know, on TV and, and tell them lessons or who are on Instagram advocating for whatever. And I'm just like, go to the source, you guys, if you want to know your questions, you want to get answers to them. Who's involved in the darkness? Who's not good? What kind of crimes are being committed? What is not being presented? Go to the people that have sat in the rooms that have seen with their own eyes that lived through the things that you're wondering Go to them. And those are survivors. Survivors are the anointed ones that that survived these things so they could set the captives free, as Nathan Reynolds says. I always love whenever he says that, you know, he's like, that's why I'm here. Like, that's my purpose. You know, I'm here to set the captives free. Like what I went through wasn't in vain, you know, and and that's so true. You know, if if, if you survive these horrible things, you pass the test. Like you, you have a testimony. You know, there's a reason why the word test is in there. And now it's yours to share you know, and you, you're, you, Max, you're doing just amazing work, you know, like you had mentors that helped you. And now you're the one sitting on the other side saying, I've come all this way. And I'm going to now have that 360 where I'm giving that gift back to other people. Do you want to talk a little bit too about some of the services that you offer that people could maybe contact you for and let people know like where all you're at on social media, all the different things. And I think you're writing a book. If you want to talk a little bit about that, just to get some hype around it. I know it's not ready yet, but whatever you want to talk about as far as, you know, where people can find you and what you're working on. Well, um, I'm, a new website is is almost ready and coming out and there will be the option. I've done all this for free. There will be the option for people to become members and um, there will be like live Q and A's a couple of times a month with me and other guests for the membership. Um, there's going to be an Ask Max feature where people can, I've always done this, but people can write in and I'll, I'll respond and give them advice and guidance. Um, I continue to interview people. Um, the summit is coming up. Um, I, I do uh, help people as a therapist, as a healer, um, particularly uh, people who have gone through, you know, ritual abuse and, and trauma. Uh, so that's a factor if people uh, can contact me through the website for that. Um, I have been meaning to write a book about my life um, and all of this. So that's coming probably uh, within the next year. Um, so I'll just leave it at that there. Uh, so yeah, and generally, um, I'm trying to live my best life, you know, have some... Uh, joy in my day. Um, I'm religious about being grateful about everything that I do have. And, uh, and I'm excited to do whatever I can to make a difference. And um, I really appreciate you, Emma, and that you give voice to survivors. And, you know, thank you so much for having me on today. And for, you know, giving me the platform to talk to people. Um, it's it's truly been a pleasure and a joy. It's an honor, Max. Your voice is so important and you're a puzzle piece to this. You know, every survivor has a story that matters for so many reasons and it gives other clues and puzzle pieces to other people's stories and it helps them construct what happened to them and helps them understand, you know, and one thing I'm noticing even is people are healing faster because there's more and more people like you coming forth and sharing condensing what you learned in 10 years and being able to give it to somebody and maybe it'll take them two instead of 10. You know, it's really beautiful. People like Kathy O'Brien who have their book, you know, and 
And it's amazing. Like I love seeing this community grow and people that get inspired by people like you and say, gosh, if Max can, can speak out, I can too. If Max can leave, I can too, you know? And so it's just this really beautiful, this beautiful sort of, um, leader follower type thing where you have people like you and Rachel and Kathy who are willing to go first. And then all of a sudden, all these people are behind you, you know, and like, we're forming our own army, we're forming God's army against this Luciferian kingdom. And you said it beautifully, they can't create, they can only copy. We're the ones that can create. That's the gift that we have that God gave us that they can never take away from us. And so all of us should be thinking, what can I contribute? And it doesn't have to be a podcast. It could just be sharing, you know, take an interview and share it with a friend. That's a great way to help somebody else understand these hard things that are going on. You know, I know we're all pressed for time. Society doesn't make it easy for us with this, you know, work structure. But again, like, what do we want to participate in you guys? You know, we, do we want to keep giving the news our attention? Do we want to keep feeding these nonprofits our money? Or do we want to go right to the source, listen to survivors, help these puzzle pieces get get fit in, bring justice to, to these, these stories and these atrocities, give our energy to the people who are giving us the truth for free, you know, and, and who are creating these beautiful projects that we can fund and, and hopefully let them keep doing what they're doing with, with our resources. You know, I always say the government's never going to give survivors a job, you know, doing what they do. We have to do that. And so I love when there's opportunities that we can pay you. I love that you're going to have a membership based thing. You know, I want everybody that's that has the courage to come up and speak. We should want every one of them, every single Max, every single Kathy O'Brien. We should want them to be able to do this full time and more, you know, and that's going to come from us. Like we have to we have to be the ones to step up and say, I'm going to quit giving my money to these corrupt people, businesses, these cor corrupt uh, nonprofits. And instead, I'm going to turn right to the source and help elevate the people who are helping to elevate the world. So I commend you, Max. You are a walking miracle in every way. You're an inspiration and it is absolutely beautiful what you have done to create and that you've given a platform yourself to other survivors on top of carrying your own weight. Can you remind people too what all platforms your podcast can be found on besides your website? Yeah, so the website is unbroken.global and then I'm on BitChute, Brighton, and Rumble. And uh, if you go there, you just enter unbroken.global and then all my videos will come up. Um, both videos that I've, interviews I've done and I've now been interviewed a lot too. So there's interviews of me there. And, you know, just something in what you were saying just reminded me to say, a lot of survivors are gonna speak at my summit. Kathy O'Brien, Annika Lucas, Rachel Vaughn, Doug McIntyre, Mary Sparrow, Laura Worley, Asia Rains, and others, and they're all going to talk about their the way that they healed. So it's going to be a, a really a awesome uh, opportunity for people to learn not only to hear about survivor stories, but really it's going there's going to be an emphasis on healing. My own talk is called "Healing is a Revolutionary Act" because that's how we change the world. Maybe as uh maybe we could get together if you'd be open for it. And I'd love to have you on again to do another longer form episode, but maybe we could do a shorter one just promoting that. You could talk about mm -hmm. it and I can link it all below and we could do maybe a, a shorter episode just about that and you could explain it and I could help you market it. Thank you. That would be amazing. Thank you so much, Emma. You're a gem. You are too. <laughs> this is an honor to have you on. Is there any closing words that you want to say before uh, we, we wrap up for for this time um heal yourself you can we can come back from anything we're resilient we're full of potential um step into your power and do your little part to change the world for the children that are still going through this because i envision a world where children are safe and loved and have everything that they need and that is within our reach if we all take the, a part of it and do what we need to do. So start with yourself. Amen. And you guys go support Max. I'll have all of her links below in the show notes. No matter where you're at, it'll highlight for you guys. So you can just go click the hyperlink. And right from the podcast platform that you're on, it'll redirect you to her site. Go subscribe to her podcast. You know, one of the other things I always say is it's so good to have eyes on survivors. You know, the people that are, you know, stalking them or who don't want them to be speaking out when they see those follower counts going up man it makes them scared they don't want eyes on people like max so 
go blow her up, go encourage her, go support her. She's absolutely amazing. And she features other survivors too. So if you enjoy this podcast, you're absolutely going to love hers. You guys should all go subscribe to all of her channels. And again, I'll have that below. Um, same thing with us. Thank you guys so much for supporting this podcast. I'll have all my links below. Also, you guys, we couldn't do this without you. And it's been really cool these last few years, just watching, you know, the small amount of people that were interested, even just three years ago to all of a sudden, it seems like just this wave is exploding of people waking up and their curiosity is blooming and they're not scared of this, like how they used to be. People are now leaning into that fear and saying, it's scary to look at, but I'm going to see it anyways, because I know it's still happening today. So thank you guys all for the courage to listen to these stories and, and to stick through it with us because you see the bigger picture and understand that one day at a time and one healing at a time, we can make the world a better place. So you guys, God bless you. Thank you so much for supporting and we'll see you next time.